So the big man from Beijing is here to bless you with the word of God. Pastor Joseph Castillo. Amen. Subai. I have a little video I didn't share last time, but I brought it today. So it's a little bit of video that tells you uh, what we're doing. Amen. So you can watch the video. Where I'm from, where I'm from, my heritage and what we're doing. So it, it has volume, actually. You have to plug the, the, the audio cable. That's all right. You have to plug the audio cable in there. That began at the age of faith and purpose, wavering God. Like Nehemiah of old, God has always had a remnant who would not abandon their calling. The living legacy of Dr. Rod Parsley has been an unwavering God-directed journey of faith and purpose that began at the age of 17 with 17 people in a backyard Bible study. His path confirmed by the prophetic words spoken into his life. I present to you this sword. And I believe that this will be a night that God's holy anointing will increase. There will be an explosion of your apostolic anointing and you will multiply your apostolic anointing in every nation. I set my hands on you and separate you to that anointing and into the office of the apostle. Winds of change are coming. Dr. Rod Parsley is uniquely positioned to merge multiple streams of Holy Ghost anointing into one mighty ocean sweeping across this nation to win souls because the apex of all Christian endeavor is to place the jewel of a soul in the crown of our Savior. Launching with 10 new church plants to date and in partnership with City Reach Network. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Hallelujah. Praise. Hallelujah. Amen. So 
I think last time we were here, I was able to uh, just kind of introduce myself, get to know you guys. So today I could actually preach from the Bible. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So uh, let's get up. I'm going to try and remotely control the PowerPoint here. And I want to uh, just thank God to be here today with uh, Bishop Cheeto. We had Bishop Cheeto and Prophetess Rachel Sanchez with us in Beijing. And uh, we had a wonderful time. Uh, Bishop Cheeto was our only guest that we ever had that wanted to eat Asian food. <laughs> All of our guests always wanted to go to the Western places, but he always wanted to have the dumplings and the dim sum and, you know, all the Chinese food. So we were happy about that because, you know, West Chinese food is cheap. So that was a blessing. Amen. <laughs> but he, he kept wanting those dumplings, the Chinese dumplings, you know. So we, we, we had a blessed time with them, and um, we're happy to be back. We're excited about tomorrow. But I do have a special message for you today. So I hope you are going to take notes. The lowest form of Christianity is non-note-taking Christians. <laughs> that says to the preacher and that says to God, you already know everything. There's nothing, you're not expecting to receive something that's going to change your life. Amen. Now, you know the word, uh, when we talk about getting revelation, yes. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Both okay. Both okay. So, we'll, uh, the word, when you get revelation or light, the word in the Greek is, uh, is the English word for photo or photons or photosis. So when you get a revelation, it comes to your mind like a photograph. It comes quickly. And you have to pull that down and receive it. And it's good to, to do that by writing it down, just like a dream. When you wake up, you remember a dream. But if you don't grab it, if you don't pull it from the soul realm, then you lose it. And then you might have to pray in the Holy Ghost to bring that dream back. So revelation comes in the spurts of light. That's why it's important when you're in a ministry in a church like this that you have pen and paper ready to write down revelation because you're expecting revelation. Amen. How many of you guys know that the atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles? Yeah. Amen. And we should always come to church expecting God to do something great in our lives, expecting to hear from God. Amen. So this messages will be rebroadcast. So if you don't have a pen and paper, that's fine. But if you do have a pen and paper, I encourage you to take notes because I'm going to preach something to you that I would, I would, you know, I, I would bet my lechon that nobody here has heard before. And I love lechon, so, you know, that's a serious bet for me. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The title of my message is Possessing Eternity, God's Plan for the Ages. And we're going to look here at John chapter 1 and verse 1. And I am, I'm clicking, but, oh, I got to play it, I think. Okay, is it, let's see. Is it working? I'm going to go. John 1 to 1, is it working? Let me see. Did you do that or did I do that? You did that. Let me try if it works again for me. It's not, you're going to have to do the slides because it's not working for me, I guess. So we'll, we'll start at John 1 1. Are you ready? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you today for the grace and the wisdom of God upon me. I bind now all the rulers of darkness that are assigned to keep people in darkness. And I pray, Father God, that lights, revelation, Father God, would flow in this place freely unhindered and unchecked by any outside force. I thank you for me and these lips of clay that I would, you would anoint me to speak forth your word with accuracy, excellency, and boldness. We release, Father God, revelation in the presence of God. We welcome your glory in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. John chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning. Today I plan to take you back to the beginning, not just back before you were born, but I want to talk to you today and take you back before Joseph ever met Mary, before Caesar ever ruled Rome, before Confucius was ever confused. <laughs> Amen. I want to take you back before Buddha ever had his iconic star of delusion sitting under that, that, that tree. Amen. I want to take you back before Solomon ever had wisdom, before David ever slew Goliath. In fact, I want to take you back before God ever blew the breath of life into the nostrils of man and he became a living soul. 
But I promise you when we're done, I'm going to take you back to today, the very last days. Amen. Now, the resurrection of Christ, we have to understand, was not just about the forgiveness of our sins, but it was also about our resurrection with him. Amen. And it's also about the defeat of satanic power in the world. You see, many millenniums ago, El Elyon, Jehovah, possessor of the heavens and the earth, began to implement his plan of creation. If I'm speaking too fast, you can say, Pastor, slow down. Amen. Hallelujah. Before creation, before the creation of the earth, God set into motion a plan. God created before the earth heavenly host. Somebody say heavenly hosts. Speaking of Christ, the Bible says in John 1, 1, in the beginning, before Adam, before Eve, before the garden, before earth, way back in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. All things were made by Jesus, the logos, the word. And without Jesus was not anything made that was made. Are you clicking the slides? You're not following me. Amen. That was made. Amen. You can click the next slide. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 do we have 116? It says, for by him, who's that him? That's the logos. That's the word from John 1, 1. From by him, are you ready for this today? I'm about to take you somewhere you've never been before. Right. Let me look. I want to see you ready. Lean up in your chairs a little bit like, like you're watching a good movie. Amen. <laughs> I'm about to take you somewhere today. You ain't ready for this. Amen. For by the Logos, by God, by Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, next slide, dominions, correct, principalities, powers, or things created by him and for him. All things were created by Jesus and all things were created for Jesus. The Godhead, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These three are one. They existed in timeless past and they began to come together as one and to create. Well, they were one, but they began to create together the heavens and the earth. The universe existed before the earth. The angels were in existence prior to the earth. Job highlights this fact in Job chapter 38, verses 4 and 7. This is what Job says. God responding to Job says, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? In verse 7 he says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy we're going to see this term morning again in a few minutes when he says the morning stars sang together what are the morning stars we're going to get into that in a minute and the sons of god that shouted for joy in the beginning when he laid the foundations of the earth we see the hosts were created the sons of god were created interesting enough the only time the word sons of God is used in the entire Old Testament was with one human being. Only one human being before Jesus Christ was called the son of God. Go in your Bibles, look in Genesis, you'll see Adam was the son of God. After Adam, the Bible says, now these are the generations of the sons of man. So only one person was referred to as the son of God prior to Jesus Christ coming in the new birth and the resurrection, and that was Adam. So these other sons of God are Bene Elohim in the Hebrew, is speaking of these, these heavenly beings that God made before the earth was, was, was designed. So this term sons of God is the same chapter used in Job chapter 1, when the Bible says that Satan came with the other sons of God. They came before God. They came into heaven. They came before God in, Je in Job chapter 1. The same sons of God. So if we look at that, we see that somehow Satan has had some kind of a limited access to heaven. And that he has some kind of access to heaven. If you go over to the book of Revelations, you see that he still has some kind of access because he goes before the throne of God to accuse the church day and night. Am I right? And he will be cast down from that. Turn to your neighbor and say, the ministry of accusation... 
is Satan's ministry. We're not called to point out the gap. We're called to stand in the gap. Amen? Amen. The ministry of accusation is Satan's ministry. And whenever you find yourself thinking that you're called of God to defend the faith or point out somebody's sin, you have just entered Satan's ministry. Okay? Your ministry is to intercede and to pray for and to stand in the gap. Do you hear me? So... In Job chapter 1, we fast forward possibly billions of years later and we see Lucifer, Satan, going with the other sons of God to make reports of things happening amongst the earthlings. Satan came with them because he once was one of these angels. We see somehow this limited access in Revelation. What we do know clearly about Lucifer or Satan is that he was once an archangel. According to scriptures, there's at least a few that we know of. I'm not an angelologist, so may, I don't know if there's more than three, but I know of a couple. There's Michael, right? There's Gabriel. There's Lucifer. Lucifer was a beautiful angel. He was perfect in all his ways. He was created... And by the anointed one, he was created by Jesus, say by Jesus, the anointed one, to be in service to the anointed one. So Lucifer was created by Jesus to be in service to Jesus. But over time, he became corrupted, the Bible says, because of his beauty. I remember my my pastor, Rod Parsley, he was dating his wife for seven years and he just couldn't settle down. And, and when Dr. Sumrall said, why don't you just marry this girl? He said, well, you know, she has this flaw and that flaw. And Dr. Sumrall said, be careful. Never marry somebody without flaws. Find somebody with something a little bit wrong with them. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Because Lucifer was lifted up because of his perfection. Do you hear me? Ezekiel 28. Let's look at this very interesting, interesting thing. Ezekiel 28, verses 12 through 15. We have it on the board there. It says, speaking to Lucifer, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Isn't that interesting that Lucifer was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, so glorious, so beautiful, yet... He did not deserve any worship. And we go over to Isaiah and we find the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, that the Bible says there was nothing in him that we should be desired of him, but he was uncomely, but he was the one that was worthy of all the glory and all the worship by all of creation. And because of that, Lucifer was lifted up in pride. He says, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Thou was in the Eden, the garden of God. He was not ruling in heaven. He was in Eden, the garden of God. Do you hear me? I'll prove it to you. Thou was in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Count with me, one, the Sardis. Count with me. Two, two, what's it say? The topaz. Three. The four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. There were nine stones enclosed in gold. This is and gold. The worksmanship of his tablets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Say he was created. This is going to come into play in a moment. I want you to remember, he is a created being. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. This word cover in the Hebrew means to build a fence around or to to protect or to defend. That's a question right there. Who was he defending from? That's very interesting, but... Another interesting point is if you take that word to defend or to keep or to protect, it's also the same concept of to sanctify or to make holy. It's like that new pair of shoes you have and you put them in your closet in that sanctified place. Amen. You don't want you know, anyone to put anything on top of it or next to it. You don't want to scratch it. Hallelujah. Or maybe that for you women, for those purses. Amen. You, you sanctify it. You make it holy. Amen. 
Well, his role was to guard the glory of God, to defend it or to sanctify it, to make it holy. That was the anointed cherub that covereth, or to build defense, to protect, to defend. And I have set thee so. Thou was in the holy mountain of God, thou walkest up and down the midst of the stones of fire, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. This beautifully clad archangel, full of wisdom, clothed in holy garments, placed in the position of leadership in the earth, not heaven, but in the garden of God, was there, appointed by God. And Lucifer began to be lifted up in pride because of his wisdom and his beauty. Isaiah records this in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. We see God recording this in another chapter. And he says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? So here, here we go again with this term, son of the morning. Or the sons of the morning. What does that mean? This is not just po poetic lingo. But sons of the morning and son of the morning means the species of beings that were created in the earliest time of all creation. Which was called the morning of creation. Do you hear that? So sons of the morning means the creations of the very first of the first of the first creations. Many millenniums ago. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart five amazing things. One, he said, I will ascend into heaven. So if he was going to ascend into heaven, where was he? Once again, we find God giving a sense of the geographical location of Satan's ministry was not in the heavens, it was on the earth. Two, I will ascend into heaven. Two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Meaning that his throne or place of dominion and rule was under the stars of God. Let's continue on. Three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregations in the sides of the north. And four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. He was under the cloud realm, under the cloud level. He was not above the clouds. He was not in heaven. He was on the earth realm and that heaven between earth and the clouds. He said, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high God. But God says, yet you shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pits. Lucifer attempting not only to rebel against God, but to invade heaven and overthrow God's kingdom, declared five I wills. I'll be like the most high God. I'll invade heaven. I'll overthrow the kingdom. I'll sit in the sides of the congregation of the north. But God responded with five I wills of his own. In Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 16, let me show you. God responds to him with five I wills of his own. He says, one, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. Two, I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the mist of the stones of fire. Three, he says, thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast be corrupted by the wisdom and reason of thy brightness. Three, I will cast thee to the ground. Four, I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. And five, I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Let me tell you, God has an answer for everything that the devil has said for your life. The devil says you're going to be in sin. You're never going to overcome this. Your mom had that addiction. Your father had that addiction. Your father was divorced. You'll be divorced. You're going to be a playboy. Here's a playboy. And, and, and this is a generation of girls. But God says that I will perfect that which can Concerneth thee. He said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. The devil says, you're this. You're going to get sickness. You're going to get disease. You're going to die of this sickness or illness. But God says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. That he, he blesses your bread and blesses your water. But he takes sickness away from the midst of thee. That by his stripes, he was bore your sickness and disease. Do you hear me? 
devil says you're always going to be broke. You're always going to be in lack. You're never going to have enough. But God says that we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you, through his poverty, might be rich. God has an answer for every lie of the devil. Do you hear me? God has the last word. The devil says you're always going to struggle with that sin. But God says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. He that began the good work, he's the same one that's going to be faithful to finish it and perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God has the last word in your life. And as long as you believe that, you'll come on top and you'll come over. Do you hear me? God has an answer for every lie of the devil. Notice that we're on Lucifer... We have these stones that were placed in him. Let's go to the next slide. These stones were placed in Lucifer. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle. Nine stones. If you fast forward possibly billions of years later, you see these same stones again in the book of Exodus 28. So you see Lucifer's stones in Ezekiel 28 and, and, and man's stones in Exodus 28. Quite interesting. Maybe it's a coincidence. I don't know. Hallelujah. But it says here in Exodus chapter 28, verse 2. Thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother. For what? For glory and beauty. The same thing Lucifer had. He had the glory and he had the beauty. So we see God restoring something here. You should make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. God then tells them to make six garments in total. A breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a coat, a mitre, a girdle. And these, in verse 4, he says that these holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, and his sons are so that they may minister to me in the priest's office. We go to Exodus chapter 28, verse 17. We begin to look a little bit closer to one of these garments called the ephod. And it says here that, in verse 17, that thou shalt set in it settings of stones, even four rows of stones. The first, you know the Bible says you are living stones? It doesn't mean you're rocks. Living rocks. Like, what's that cartoon that he likes with the little rock guys? Let it go. Frozen. You know, the little rock creatures, you know, you're living stones. We're not little rock creatures. That, that stones actually means gems. That you're living gems. Hallelujah. Priceless gems. Hallelujah. So it says here, the first row, say first row, shall have sardis, one. The topaz, two. The carbuncle, three. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall have the emerald, four. The sapphire, the diamond. And the third row, the ligor, the agate, the amethyst, nine. And the fourth row shall have the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, twelve. 12 stones, and they shall be set in gold in their enclosures. Isn't that interesting? Just like Lucifer, set in gold. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Everyone with his name shall they be according to the 12 tribes. Somebody say 12. The ephod had 12 stones in them, each of those stones having the name of a child, one of the children of Israel, inscribed in them. Lucifer was also clothed in some type of holy garment, also beautiful and glorious. But you got to understand that ephods in Judges chapter 8, verse 27, and chapter 17, verse 5, they were also used in devil's idolatrous worship. Perhaps they were just mocking the priest of God, but we know that Satan worshipers today still like to mock God in their black masses and use inversions of scriptures in their own type of of holy garments and, and so forth. They dress as priests and so on, mocking God. But God only gave Lucifer 
nine stones, and we see the ephah, the ones that God gave man, were how many stones? Now the architect of the most complex designs of the universe doesn't just throw things together and hope that it comes out in the end. The fingerprint of God can be found all throughout your life, all throughout this church, all throughout history, all throughout the Word of God. Do you know that if you take a, a, the, 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 the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and you use a, a, a sequence, it might be every 22nd letter, in the Hebrew, going from the last verse of Deuteronomy backwards, and from the first verse of Genesis forwards, do you know what it says? It says Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. From Deuteronomy backwards to the center, it says Yeshua, 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 going backwards. And the very middle four words is Yud He Bad He. Jehovah. God pointing to himself through Jesus Christ in the written in the Hebrew code. There is nothing in the Bible by accidents, my friends. Do you hear me? So we go on and we begin to look at this and we see that in his divine doings, the fingerprint of God is written in our lives. Twelve is mentioned 212 times in the Bible. There's only one number in the entire Bible used more than 12 and that's the number seven. Seven meaning perfection or completion, wholeness, amen, shalom. There's 12 main constellations in the circuit of heaven. 12 months in the solar year, 12 main bones on the torso, 12 hours in a day, 12 major organs, brains, lungs, hearts, so on, cannot live without these 12 major organs, 12 vital minerals needed for the blood and normal tissue use, development, we have a doctor here, amen, hallelujah, 12 opening cranial nerves in the brain to control the thought patterns, 24 ribs, 12 on each Side. There were 12 princes to come from Ishmael in Genesis 17, 20. There's 12 tribes of Israel. There's 12 stones on the altar with 12 pillars. There's 12 cakes on the showbread. There's 12 spies that were sent to Jordan. There was 12 oxen to carry the brass lever in 1 Kings 7, 25. Jesus called... 12 disciples. Thank you. You're listening. Revelation chapter 12. We see the foundations of the new Jerusalem. We see there's 12 gates to the city. There's 12 manners of fruits and the tree of life. 144 different fruits throughout an entire year. 144,000 square meters to the temple mount and 144,000 Jewish evangelists to be called in the last time. God does things with perfection. Do you hear me? 24 elders, 12 and 12. There's 12 divine, 12 is a divine order. It means government. 120 in the upper room, 12 times 10. Do you hear me? And there's 12 jewels in the breastplate given by God to man that was not given to Lucifer. God gave Lucifer nine stones and God gave man 12. It gets interesting when you begin to see which three stones did God give us that he did not give Lucifer. The Ligur stone, number one, which had Gad's name inscribed on it. The Agate stone, which had Issachar's name inscribed on it. And the amethyst stone, excuse me, excuse me, agate had Asher's name, sorry. Agate had Asher's name inscribed on it, if you're taking notes. notes. And 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 the the amethyst amethyst gem gem had had Issachar's name name inscribed inscribed on it. Now you might be wondering wondering what this is all about. about. Well, let me take you back back to show you you the future. future. Genesis Genesis chapter chapter 49. 49. Jacob Jacob calls calls his 12 12 sons sons to to him. And in 49, and in 49 verse, verse 1, it says, says Jacob, Jacob called, called unto, unto his sons, sons and, he and he said, Gather, gather yourselves, yourselves together, together that, I that I may tell you something, you something which shall befall, befall you, you in, the, in the... Let me hear let you. Me hear you. Last, last days. days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For those, for those, those of you who are listening to the screen. Amen. This term, this term last, last days, days is quite, quite interesting, interesting because, because it's only used 33 times, times in the entire, entire Bible. Bible. And, and each and, and every time, time this term, term last days is used, used 
each and every time it's referring to either the second, the first, or second advent of Christ. So here we are, Jacob begins to prophesy over his kids the first and the second advent of Christ. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? He prophesies, he prophesies to Issachar, saying, in verse, verse 14, I have it on, this, on, the, on, the, the, projector. on the, the projector, verse 14, Issachar, Issachar, Issachar whose, name whose name is inscribed, is inscribed on the amethyst, amethyst gem. gem, he says, he says Issachar, Issachar is, is a strong, strong ass. ass. I didn't, I didn't, just, just, I didn't cuss, I didn't cuss so, so don't get offended, don't get offended amen. amen. This means don't the king, king, the king James, James amen. Issachar is a strong ass. That's what my mother used to call me, but she meant it another way. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Crouching. Crouching. The typo. I was, I was on my couch, on my couch at, that at that time. Crouching. Crouching. Says in your, says Bible, in your Bible. Crouching, crouching down, down between two burdens. The first thing, first stone God did not give Lucifer. Verse 19. Gaddy prophesied, you are a troop shall overcome you, but you shall overcome at the last. In other words, you will overcome. You'll be overcame, but you will overcome in the end. Hallelujah. And Asher, he prophesies. Uh, that's why I named my son Asher. Out of Asher, his bread shall be fat, and he shall yield royal dainties. Now, this might just seem like a coincidence to you, but you can't just read the Bible. You have to read the Bible. Do you hear me? What's interesting is that there were four rows on the ephod. Do we have a picture of that ephod there? Let's click it again. See if we get that ephod again. We have four rows on the ephod. There were three stones missing on Lucifer. Now, if it was three random stones like this one here and that one over there, and you know, maybe we, we would not be able to draw something from it. But guess which three stones are missing on the ephod. The entire third row. The entire third row was missing on Lucifer's ephod. The three stones missing were the ligor, the agate, and the amethyst. Not three random stones scattered around the ephod. Do you hear me? We see the third row, three stones, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, were made in His image and His likeness, spirit, soul, and body. Crucify Him. Bury Him. Roll a stone over His tomb. Put soldiers there to guard that tomb. But in how many days? But in three days, He's coming back up. Do you hear me? The entire third row was missing from Lucifer's ephod. God prophetically took out the entire third row from Lucifer's covering in the day that he was created. In the earliest time of all creation, before anything was began and he made the sons of God, he made Lucifer the covering cherub with three missing abilities. These three abilities were given to the Son of Man, but not to the devil. One, Asher, you shall yield royal dainties. In other words, Satan, you'll never have the ability to give birth to a royal seed. You see, you don't understand that. You, you, you see, atheists want to argue with you. They don't believe the Bible because God used to have to uh, tell the children of Israel to genocide entire people groups. What you don't understand is that those people groups were inseminated with angels that fell. The sons of God mixed and mingled their seed with the children of men. And they were races of Raphaim, the dead ones. They were races of, of mixed seed, mixed with Lucifer's seed, with angelic fallen seed and human seed. So God said you had to wipe them all up. You think that Noah, who's getting drunk and sleeping with his kids, sleeping with his daughter, you think he was so perfect in his generation? Absolutely wrong interpretation of the Bible. When it says that Noah was perfect in his generation, it does not mean that Noah was so holy. It means that he had a pure bloodline. God called Abraham, sanctify Abraham, said don't intermarry because he was trying to give birth to a royal seed. He had to keep a sanctified bloodline. Do you hear me? 
He says, Satan, you'll never give birth to a royal seed. Satan is still trying to. You, I go to Africa and I, I, mean, I speak to Africans. That you hear all kinds of stories about women that are having demonic relationships at night with evil spirits. You, if you study Satan worship and witchcraft, you find that they're always dedicating virgins and young girls to, to Satan, demonic spirits. And they have intercourse so they can give birth to some kind of demonic seeds. Satan is still trying to give birth to some kind of demonic breed. But it's not in him. It wasn't given to him. Him. God said, I'm going to give birth to a royal seed. He shall crush your heel, but he shall crush his head. Do you hear me? You don't understand the weight of this. Gad. Hallelujah. God made us in a way. He made us in a way that the royal seed could only come from royalty. You see, you're made in the image and the likeness of God. You are made in the image and likeness of God. God's the king of kings. So you're royalty. So the royal seed had to come through royalty. If it comes any other way, the Bible says the same as a thief and a robber has to come through the womb of a woman. Because God only gave that ability to man, mankind. Satan is not a prince. He is not a son of the king. He's not a son of God as Adam was a son of God. He's not the son of God as Jesus is the only begotten son of God. Do you hear me? And now that you're born again, you're the firstborn among many brethren. Do you hear me? Issachar, you shall crouch between two burdens. In other words, Satan, you'll never be able to carry the weight of another person's sin. That's why Jesus said, take my burden, take my yoke, which is light and which is easy. Because there is no relief from the burden of life when you live in sin. Because Satan was never given the ability to relieve the burden of sin. But Job said, in the prophesying of the mysteries of the ages, Job said, is there a day's man betwixt us? Is there somebody that can stand in the gap? Is there somebody who could create that bridge between God's holiness and man's sinfulness and fallenness? Jesus became that day's man between us. Jesus became that burden bearer. He became that, that person to take and carry that. He became that Issachar, hallelujah, crouching between the cross and the grave. Do you hear me? And lastly, Gad, thou art a troop. Thou, thou shall be, oh, excuse me, you shall be overcome by a troop. But in the end, you shall overcome. This is where we ought to start shouting, amen. The devil might have you down. He might have you struggling. He might have you up against a Red Sea. But he does not have the ability to overcome in the end. If you don't give up, if you don't quit, if you don't stop, if you don't faint, if you don't get weary, if you don't stop coming to church, if you don't stop praying, if you don't stop giving, you're not going to lose. There's no way for you to lose. It's not in you. You don't have the ability to lose. That's why the devil just wants you to give up. Hallelujah. Do you hear me? If Moses and the children of Israel would have went back at the Red Sea, they would have lost everything. But instead, they stretched forth the rod and they, the waters parted before them. Do you hear me? You got to have the faith that says, if I go down, God's going down with me. We're going to do this together, Lord. And if I go down, you're going down with me. Why is that? Because he's not going down. Do you hear me? Resist the devil. That word resist, I had Pastor Christo Dula from Cyprus come. He's an expert in the ancient Greek. I had him in my church when I was in Montreal, and he told us, you might have seen Christo Dula on Benny Hinn. He's one of Benny Hinn's friends. And he told us that word resist doesn't mean like the, ch like the church. We think this is resist. Oh. We think that's resisting trying not to sin, trying to give our, you know, trying to serve God, trying not to, that's not resist. The word resist in the Greek is a, the picture of it is, can you stand up, Dr. Mark, please? Amen. Can you, can you, can you look at me like a, you ever seen the, the UFC when they're about to fight? Head to head, head to head, head to head. head, to head. This, this is resist. In the Greek, it means forehead to forehead, resist. 
That's what it means. In other words, as long as you are on the offense, as long as you're coming after him, hallelujah, not tummy to tummy, amen. (laughs) I'll win that one, brother, every time, hallelujah. Resist means head forehead to forehead. If you don't give up, if you continue to give, continue to pray, continue to abandon, you know what? Do you know what I do when the devil gets me tied up? I just go out street witnessing, evangelizing, casting out devils, healing the sick. Because if I don't give up, he's going to be the one on the run because he doesn't have the ability in him to overcome. Satan was created with a handicap. Do you hear me? When God made man, he made him us, me and you, not Lucifer. He made man in the image and the likeness of God. Not Lucifer. Do you hear me? Only you were made in the image and the likeness of God. Only you were made with the DNA of royalty. Only you were made with the ability to overcome in the end. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from heaven just that fast. Just like lightning. Just that fast. Sweatless victory. Do you hear me? You don't have to toil and fight the devil. Hallelujah. He's already defeated. Just like that. Falling from heaven like lightning. Demons always say, "Ah, I'm not coming out. They always say that and then they come out. You, you can't listen to them, amen? They're a liar, hallelujah. They're defeated, hallelujah. Your biggest problem is you, not the devil, amen? Your biggest problem is you. That's why we have to crucify the flesh. Do you hear me? Adam bowed his knee to a defeated alien spirit. And he gave back the authority that God gave him over all the world. He gave it back to Lucifer. Lucifer wanted it because he once had it. Lucifer once protected the garden. Adam was made to protect the garden. Lucifer was once given the ephod. Mankind was given the ephod. Do you hear me? Before the world began, God put in his plan the design for a royal seed to come and carry our burdens on the cross and to overcome the devil. Do you hear me? That's why in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, verse 6 through 9, I want to show you something also in in, in Psalms. But I want to go here quickly to Romans. Romans chapter 10, verse 6 through 9, it says this. The righteousness of faith speaks like this. In other words, faith people talk like this. Faith people talk like this. That's what Jesus was doing. Jesus wanted to show them how the sons of men are supposed to operate. That's why he always said, I forgive sins, not as the son of God, but as the son of man. I heal the sick as the son of man. Jesus was trying to demonstrate to us how the son of man is supposed to operate. That's why he was frustrated when they couldn't rebuke the sea. He was frustrated when they couldn't cast out the devils. He was always calling them wicked and perverse generation. He was frustrated by the weakness of man because he knows they were made in his image and in his likeness. Do you hear me? And those three years of his ministry was not just about going to the cross because he could have went to the cross at 30. The three years of his ministry was about demonstrating to us how we're supposed to walk on water. Demonstrating to us how we're supposed to pay our bills supernaturally. Demonstrating to us how we're supposed to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the waves of the sea. Demonstrating to us what we're supposed to walk in if Adam didn't mess it up. But let me tell you, Adam did not mess up God's plan. God told Adam, I've given you dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air. Subdue it, take dominion and multiply. Then Genesis 9, God tells Noah the same thing. Replenish the earth, subdue it, take dominion, and multiply. Then Genesis 15, God tells Abraham, do the same thing. The plan of God never changed with sin. God still expected his children to walk like his children, to take dominion, to do supernatural things. Do you hear me? And Jesus lived a life to try and demonstrate that to us. Let me tell you something. Do you know when Jesus 
they came to him to pay the taxes. And he said, go and get a coin from the, from the whose mouth? From the fish's mouth. We've been led to believe that Jesus was broke that day. Or maybe he forgot his wallet and couldn't pay the taxes. So he had to do some kind of miracle to pay his taxes. That's not what he was demonstrating. Jesus was not broke. First of all, when he was born, two years later, a wise men came. They say, I, th- I forgot it was how many hundred or a hundred or something. Uh, kings came with armed guards with four million dollars. Peter J. Daniels hired a research group to study this out. He's a billionaire from Australia. And they brought four million dollars to Jesus when he was two years old. We find out that Jesus, people say, well, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of God has no place to lay his head. Fooey! That's a misinterpretation. Jesus had a house because you find he was in his house with his brothers and sisters. And they said, will you go down to Jerusalem today? And he said, no, today is not my time. And they went before him and he closed the door. And the Bible says he looked out the window. And when he saw them leave, he went down there. Because it wasn't his time five minutes ago. But now is his time. Amen. Do you hear me? That was his house. Where him and his brothers and his sisters lived with his mother Mary. And there was no father. We don't know what happened. Maybe he died, some scholars say. We don't know what happened, but that's okay because they have plenty of money. They had a carpentry business. Jesus Jesus had so much money, he had a personal accountant. How many of you have a personal accountant? You don't need a personal accountant when you're broke. Jesus was not in lack of money. He wasn't demonstrating us, oh, when you're really struggling financially and, you know, God could do a miracle to pay your rent. No. He was showing you that even when you had the money, you don't have to rely on your salary to pay your bills. You don't have to rely on your salary to pay your tuition. You don't have to rely on your parents or your accountant. You don't even have to walk to the bank. To pull out money when you have a need. You can operate in supernatural overflow. You don't have to dig into your pockets every time God tells you to do something. Pastor says give an offering for this project, that project. You don't have to dig into your pockets. Look how much money you have. All you have to do is hear the voice of God and find out how much he wants you to give and believe. Jesus was demonstrating to us how we're supposed to live. Because the just shall live by faith. So this is how faith talks in righteousness. Verse it talks like this, on this wise. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Meaning, oh, I got to go storm the gates of heaven to get a miracle. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Don't say that. That's to bring Christ down from above. Asking God to come down and do something for you. You don't need that. Or you don't talk like this. Who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ from the dead. You don't need another resurrection miracle. No, 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 no. But what do you need? What saith it? The word is nigh thee. The word is nigh thee. It's even in your mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Confess, confess the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? That Jesus is Lord over the finances of the earth. That Jesus is Lord over all health and healing. That Jesus is Lord over all demonic powers. That Jesus is Lord over those properties and those possessions and that tuition and your school and your life. If you confess that he is Lord over your health, he is Lord over your finances, and you believe it in your heart, you shall be soteria. Greek soteria. We thought this just meant I'm going to go to heaven. That's not what it means. Soteria is healing, deliverance, prosperity, protection. Do you hear me? So if you declare Jesus is the Lord of my life, I dwell in the secret place of the Most High God. I abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And believe it in your heart. You shall be delivered from danger, delivered from sickness, delivered from disease. That God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Soteria, not just going to heaven. The word of God is in your mouth. You don't need to ask God to come down 
and do something again, go to the cross again to die again, it's in your mouth. This is the word of faith. Not only did Jesus ascend on high, he didn't just die and then go from the, to heaven, but the Bible says he descended. We see that right here in this verse. Right here in this verse, that is to bring him up from the dead again. He descended. He descends in the, the Apostles' Creed that he descended into the lower parts of the earth. He descended into the lower parts of the earth and he faced Satan, resisted, faced him face to face in open combat. The Bible tells us in Colossians, do we have it on the board? In Colossians, that when Jesus came face to face with Satan, it says here that he spoiled principalities. Somebody say spoiled. He spoiled principalities. That word spoil means to strip or to pluck. It's the, it's the idea of a chicken. If you take a chicken and you pluck all his feathers, and it's a featherless chicken, he plucked Satan of all the power, all the tools, all the abilities, all the things that he had. Jesus left him totally naked. Totally stripped him. That's why no weapon formed against you shall prosper because he's been disarmed. No weapon can prosper against you because Jesus disarmed his weapons. Hallelujah. It's like a North Korean rocket. <laughs> Do you hear me? Hallelujah. Do you hear me? Jesus rose from the dead with the, the keys to death, hell, and the grave. But I got good news for you today. He didn't put the keys in his pocket and drive home. He didn't take the keys with him, my friends. He gave them to you. He went and he got the keys back. He got dominion over the earth back. He got dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air. He got your subduing authority back. And he didn't take it to heaven, but he came and he gave it to you. That's why the word is near you. It's even in your mouth. The word of faith that, you, that we preach, that you speak with your mouth, believe in your heart, and declare with your mouth, and every mountain shall be made a plain, and every valley shall be raised up, and everything in your life that's an obstacle, God says that you shall have whatsoever it is. Say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and it shall not, and if you don't believe, if you don't doubt in your heart, it shall, shall obey you. Do you hear me? Because he gave you the keys. He didn't take them with him to heaven. He didn't say, oh, I got all my God power back and I'm going to just take it with me to heaven. No. Matter of fact, he still had all his God power in heaven. He did all that just to bring your power back here on earth. It was about redeeming you. About bringing you back to the top. Do you hear me? Look, Satan was created by the hands of God. And if you can with me, let's, let's go here to Psalms chapter, Psalms chapter 6. I think it's 6 or 8. I want to show you this. Yeah, see, let's go to Psalms chapter. You could just, I, I could help you with that. Oh, could you do it that way? Can you do it that way? L let, me, let me help you with it. Let me help you right here. Sorry about this, guys. You got it? Don't touch it. All right. Am I, is my hand sweaty? What's going on here? Saw. There we go. Psalms. I want to show you this verse because it's worth it. Say it's worth it. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go to eight. Look at this with me. Look at verse 3 and downwards. Here's David looking at the stars. And he's reflecting. Little ruddy, red-headed. Stinky David hanging out there in the, with the sheeps. All his brothers bigger and stronger and better looking. David is said to be born out of wedlock. That's why he was, his dad was ashamed to bring him in when, when the prophet came. He pretended he didn't have David because David was the shame of the family, the black sheep. And David's sitting out there with God and he's looking at the, the stars in the sky. And he says, when I consider the heavens and the work, of your fingers. What did the fingers of God make? He made 
every principality, every power, every dominion, every ruler. The fingers of God made Lucifer himself. He says, when I consider the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars that thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little bit lower than the angels. This is a good word, church, so I'm sure that you've been taught. This is the only place in the Bible that the word angels was translated this way. And the entire Bible, Elohim, was never translated angels except for this verse right here. But now in newer translations of the Bible, they are actually translating it properly. The authors of the King James Version were afraid to write Elohim, which is God, because they thought they would, it would be blasphemy and they would be killed. So they didn't write that. But actually it says, thou hast made him a little bit lower than God. In other words, in the entire universe, the highest authority in the universe outside of the Godhead is guess who? You. You're going to judge angels. You're going to judge Lucifer and the devils of hell. Hallelujah. The highest authority in the entire universe is man. Outside of God is man. Do you hear that? Thou hast made him a little bit lower than God is, crowned him with glory and honor, and made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and has put what? All things, say it with me, all things, all things, what's left after all? There's nothing left after all. He's put all things under his feet. That's why I, I hear preaching that say, oh, you know, you got to be careful. This one's a principality and that one's a power and this one's a ruler of darkness. You got to be careful with that. Let me tell you, you have dominion over all devils, over all diseases, over principalities, powers, over all mights, all dominions. Look at here. My little three-year-old boy has more dominion over him than the angels of God. Do you hear me? Now, true enough, a cheetah. Or a lion might be faster in his physical ability. But they're not the king of the jungle, my friend. You are. Yeah. Do you hear me? They, the angels can do things you can't do. And they might be stronger and bigger in, in physical ways. But when we talk about authority, hallelujah, they must obey you. Hallelujah. Don't you know that you have angels assigned to you? And most of your angels are collecting cogwebs. They're just sitting up there because they're waiting for you to loose them, to assign them, to call them out, to make them to work. Because they hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord God in your mouth. Do you hear me? God has made you a little bit lower than Elohim himself and has put everything under your dominion. Do you hear me? And the commands never change. Subdue. It's never changed. Multiply. It's never changed. Be fruitful. It's never changed. Fill the earth. It's never changed. It's time for the church to rise up and to begin to take their seats of authority. To begin to take their seats of dominion. Let me tell you, when I was working in those just working jobs, and I go apply for a job, I came in like I was the CEO. Amen. I didn't come in, oh, could I get a job? I don't know. I don't have any skills. I came in like, the, I'm the boss. And I, some people even gave me jobs. They said, we gave you the job because you just, you, you, you look like, you know, you came in here like the boss. And I laughed. I said, because I... I, I, when I look in the mirror, I see a son of God. I see a king and a priest. I see somebody that has a limited potential. I apply for jobs I'm not even qualified for. Because God qualifies the unqualified. Do you hear me? Faith in the anointing is equal ground. It's the equalizer. Do you hear me? Amen? When you operate in faith, you're equal ground. Hallelujah. How many know there's an advantage of being disadvantaged? There's an advantage of being disadvantaged. I was born an orphan, abused, mother died from AIDS, father shot and killed. Grew up with no mother, no father, no money, no nothing. But how many know I have an advantage over so many of my peers? Because being disadvantaged taught me to rely on God. Being disadvantaged taught me to use my faith. 
being disadvantaged gave me a mindset, well, I don't got nothing to lose. I might as well trust God. Hallelujah. And when others give in and fail and quit when the tough gets going, I say, I've been through worse. I've seen worse. I've experienced worse. Amen. And in the end, I have the ability to overcome. And in the end of every challenge that you have, every foe that you face, you were given the ability to go by God to overcome through him. Let's stand to our feet. Hallelujah, Jesus.